The advice and opinions expressed by the host of Autism Live and her guests are meant solely as suggestion and should not be in any way construed as child-specific advice. The Center for Autism and Related Disorders advises working with a board-certified behavior analyst who has experience with autism before starting any intensive behavioral intervention. Any choices you make in determining your child's treatment are completely at your own discretion. Good morning and welcome to Autism Live 2020. It's like uh, the, the eighth go-round, ninth go-round. I think this we're starting our ninth season. Uh, I, anyway, I'm Shannon Penrod, thrilled to be here on this first show of 2020. We have to give a big shout out to Traven Hardy. He is our live content producer and it is his one year anniversary of being with us. So what a wonderful year and thank you Traven for being so amazing. Uh, and, and for keeping this, not only keeping us on the rails, but improving our viewership, we really appreciate you so much. Uh, thrilled to have him here. We, uh, I'm glad to be here, glad to be back here. It always feels weird when we're away for a while. It feels like the first week, I'm like, I don't know what to do. And then the, the second week, I can entirely forget everything I ever knew. And then we come back and I'm like, have we ever done this before? Uh, it feels all fresh and new. And, and they say it's like a bicycle. Yeah, maybe by tomorrow I'll be back in that mode. But for now, it's like, ah, show. Uh, but thrilled to be here with you guys. We're going to be with you live for the next hour. And, uh, you know, on Wednesdays, whenever we can, we bring you uh, Dr. Doreen, Ask Dr. Doreen. And sometimes when we can't, we have the privilege of bringing you the wonderful Evelyn Kung, and today is an Evelyn Kung day, so I'm very excited and thrilled to be telling you about that. Traven has started to show you some of the different ways that you can interact with us during this next hour because there's a, a, a lot that we'll talk about during this hour. We're going to start with some of the questions that you guys have sent in over the break, one in particular that uh, a mom has written in and said, please, I, I need some help and support with this question. But then we will start to take questions from the live feed and Traven's showing you some of the different ways that you can write your question in, obviously Facebook and YouTube. Um, but there is also the live feature on our homepage, which is autism-live.com. And if you go there at the very bottom of the page, there's a chat button. If you click on that, it opens up a box and you can write in there and it shows up here on my screen. It takes a couple of minutes to appear, so uh, write in early and often, as I like to tell you, just like voting, right? Isn't that what they say? Vote early and often. And uh, we love to have an opportunity to answer as many questions as we can. We do like to remind you that there is no expert, especially in this field, who could give individual specific advice in this format. So when you write in, be as specific as you can be, include what major city you're closest to so that we get a feel for what resources may or may not be available to you, and then know that your questions will be answered in a general nature to help you to know what direction you might wanna go in to have an expert who has eyes on the subject to weigh in because it would be a disservice to the person on the spectrum to feel that somebody could just write a paragraph and, the, and that we could diagnose or, um, or com come up with a solution to the issue, right? So the advice will be of a general nature to help you down your path. Having said all of that, I wanna welcome to the show Evelyn Kung. Thank you. You are the clinical director here at the Center for Autism and Related Disorders, and you've been working in this field for how many? 20 something. 20 something. Uh, <laughs> it's probably, I'm sure on some Closer days. Closer to the 30 end. Uh, I'm, I'm sure sometimes it feels like 20 something decades that you've been working in this field. But Evelyn uh, has such a rich base of knowledge in, in treating so many kiddos successfully, too, um, that she's sort of the touchstone that we all go to when there's an issue and, and everybody runs to her and says, what do you do when? Um, and at some point, she's seen some version of it, yeah, which usually. is a pretty amazing thing. So we welcome you back. Thank, Thank you. you for being here uh, on our first maiden voyage, first show, uh, live show 2020. 
2020. Doesn't it feel weird? It's that so strange. It's 20, like, how, <laughs> who would have ever thought? Uh, okay, I'm going to, if it's okay with you, I'm going to jump right into this because we, we had somebody write in just before the holiday when we were breaking, and then I, I guess it was just after we broke for the holiday, and then they've written in a couple of times. Two separate questions, and one is, how can I teach my son about death, which I really... I want to cover that in a general nature, but they also wrote in and said, hello, Shannon. I've just seen the most disturbing disturbing behavior from my 11-year-old son, and I'm scared out of my mind. My son got a knife and tried to poke or cut our bunny rabbit, his bunny rabbit, the one he asked for last, at last year at Christmas but doesn't take care of. He plays uh, Terraria, which is a game I'm not as familiar I don't, with. I'm not talking about. He's not low functioning, but he's not high functioning. Some of his stereotypical repetitive language talks about dying or death. This is unacceptable. We have two little girls, three and four. I know our son used to like Minecraft. How the heck can I help him understand the difference between a game and real life? What programs can I ask ABA to run with him to help him? What can I do? I'm a mom and an RBT, yay, uh, which I did because uh, uh, for him and to help others, uh, but I'm just sick. My son only takes Prozac for anxiety, nothing else. He is so loving, but this side of him makes me angry. And there's a lot of fear. Lots of fear. And a lot of anger. Um, and, and a lot of stress. And a lot of stress. So let's let's see where do you want to wade into this? Well, what part can, do you want to start with? Just about generally about death, or do you want to start about the rabbit first? Let's start with the rabbit first, because okay. I think that's the thing, and then and then we can because all of our kids need to learn about death mm -hmm. and understand what it is. But let's start with the rabbit because okay. I think that's the scariest part. With all the kids out there, I, one thing I tell parents is don't jump to any conclusions. Because, we, yes, we hear about the scary things, you know, about killing animals and what that might you know, be to proceed. Right. But don't jump there immediately because our kids with autism, their understanding of the world is very different from ours. And I think, like, with your question about what programs can I ask KBA to run, really the first place to start is don't make an assumption that something is terribly wrong, but make the assumption of more that they're trying to figure out what the world is. Yeah. Just like the way the kids turn the trucks over and look at the wheels. Yeah. You know, my kids with a lot of language, when I ask them what they're doing, they're sitting there trying to figure out how the wheels will run. They yeah. want to know exactly how it runs. Yeah. So almost in that way, when you have a child who wants to know what's going on, you have to stay very factual with them. You start showing them how things work. Mm -hmm. Like there is um, definitely start with real versus imagined teaching them what that means mm -hmm. because that is something that a lot of our kids do confuse yeah. just like and it's a typical stage in typical development too people are trying the kids are trying to figure out what's real versus imagined yeah. you're going to do it the same way teaching a child with autism it's just that you have to be very intentional and very concrete in categorizing what is real yeah. and what is imagined yeah. what is pretend and teaching them all the language that involves both and teaching them how to categorize. Because depending on what category falls in, you have a different response. Yeah. If I want to learn about why I keep having a headache, I'm not going to go open my head. But hey, there's this way um, we can go to the doctor. Yeah. You know, And they can show us through this, this, and this how it works. Right. And I've learned from the past that whenever there's something they're trying to find out, but maybe they're not good at asking how and why questions. Yeah. And Almost as soon as we're able to teach them some of those how and why questions on how to ask, they start asking for all these yeah. situations. But if you don't have, just like with, um, we talk about replacement behaviors for uh, very severe behaviors or challenging behaviors, it applies here too. Yeah. There's a question in there that he's trying to figure out and he can't ask that. And he doesn't know how to ask that, so he is actually going on his own and trying to do it. Yeah. So it's coming out very inappropriately. Yeah. But there are so many kids, once we teach them how to ask that question, yeah. and then we give them a way to find it. And now with the internet, it's so easy to show somebody, this is like what a heart looks like in real life. Yeah. And you can go see a video. You don't have to like go do open heart surgery yeah. <laughs> to figure out what it looks like. But there are other methods. We have a lot of parents who are physicians. I've had parents sit down with their child and just talk about this is how your blood runs and this is how it works or this is how um, when you're, the definition of death 
a, a very factual one where not you're getting that mission it's when your heart stops yeah and your brain stops and yeah. that's death and um, and a lot of times those more simplified answers are enough yeah you don't have to get into the complicated because um, just like you know when you're talking about explaining to a typical child a lot of times families want to get into you know all the multiple layers but yeah. you have to look at the child's age to see how much they are understanding yeah it's the same way I think for our kids except our kids are missing concepts okay so first step is to to not panic not panic definitely. right yeah um, and and to so the lessons that I'm sort of thinking about, there's a whole bunch of things in the cognition curriculum uh, that, am, am I correct? That that's Not even in cognition yet. Just real versus pretend isn't even in cognition. Where it's is just, that? I think it's under just basic language. Okay, I didn't realize yeah. that. Yeah, Be uh, because you're just basically trying to identify the definition okay. of what's real, what's real and what's and not. What's real and what's imaginary. Okay, and then, but I would imagine that at a certain point, that part of, part of what the issue is is understanding... Because what I read into this when the mom says, so this is what was going to happen with the bunny, and, and I've got these two little girls, she mentions that, is, is the idea of the permanence of death. And this is what is so difficult. I think it's difficult for all of us. Like for me, I'm you know a 57-year-old woman, and, and it still mystifies me how permanent death is. Mm -hmm. Um, and I know, we, you know, we have a good friend that, um, that uh, I'm just going to say, because everybody knows Nancy Allspot Jackson, when her husband died, and her son Wyatt, who was like 14 at the time, and getting him, to, I think he still struggles with the concept. I think now he gets it, but for a long time, he struggled with the concept of, well, when is dad going to come back? Mm -hmm. and, and I know that that was very frustrating, but, you know, my mom died six years ago, and i got to be honest, on certain days, if I'm tired, I'm like, when is she going to be back, mm -hmm. right? Like, I'd love to talk to her about that. When is that going to happen mm -hmm. again? And then I have to remind myself, oh, mm -hmm. not in this life. And then we go into what do I think about after this life? which is a whole other thing um, that has to be very carefully dealt with with kiddos because if you say the wrong thing, um, I, I recall that a, a, a very well-meaning pastor said to Wyatt, you know, you'll get to be with your dad again after you die. And then he was like, well, when do I get to die and go talk See to him. dad? Because he, he didn't understand you can't go back and forth. Yeah. <gasps> yeah. It's yeah. all overwhelming. Yeah, and, and it's, it's so overwhelming. And you just think... I always think, like for our kids, if you do something repetitively and if you do it long enough, you just expect it to happen. Okay. And okay. It, you have your parent or whoever it is that's there, and they've been there for 14 years. Yeah. You're not getting over it tomorrow. Right. You know, it's right. just you're going to want that person. You're going to want to talk to your mom. You're, you know, and I think that's okay. And teaching the kids it's okay to want yeah. it. Yes. But understanding that it's not coming. And I got to say that pretty much. In the beginning, like in the first week, it was almost an hourly thing mm -hmm. and with Wyatt, come. where you know every hour they had to explain to him, "No, your dad died. He's yeah. not here anymore." Um, you know, you can talk to him in different ways, but you know, and then it moved to maybe it was once a week, one, you know, once, one, a once a day, and then it was once a week, and now you know maybe occasionally it comes up in conversation. Yeah. Um, so, but for this mom. Because um, she did ask the question about death, and I feel like part of what, you know, great to explain to him, so this is your bunny, your bunny is real, your bunny is, because our kids are confused. Yeah, they're so confused, especially with all of the images now on TV, you know, I mean, oh. videos, there's just, it's everywhere. How do you teach him to ask, is this real or is this like yeah. pretend? Yeah. You know, and if you, if you can teach it and then she can start just labeling it for him. Yeah. No, this is real. This is not. Yeah. You know, this is pretend. That helps the kids categorize it. Yeah. You know, don't expect him to be able to come to his to it on his own. Yeah. But you do have to sit there and teach it. And there are so many kids. Like I remember there was a kid and this is I don't know if you remember that um, it was a Disney Indian in the cupboard. Yes. <laughs> I had a child who would go to there's a cupboard that looked like the one in the movie. Yeah. And he would literally go there, look in the cupboard, look around, and he'd be like <laughs> Yeah. To see if it was there, yes. like when that, all like I don't know oh, how yeah. long he did it for, but yeah. we, I mean, just trying to teach him that idea, that or that Buzz Lightyear wasn't going to just fly on his own. 
And, and we perpetuate this in so many different ways. We have this very rich fantasy world that, you know, we, we take kids to Disney movies. We, you know, we do things like this. And then we just have gone through holidays where, you know, there are all these myths and legends and characters that we perpetuate. It's very hard for them to know what's real and what's... I remember, um, I, have, I have a friend who has a beautiful daughter. I mean, this, this little girl, when she was little, she looked like a doll. I mean, she just, like, beautiful red curly hair that was just, like, she looked like she stepped right out of a package. But, you know, and she was tiny. And I, the first time that my son met her, he walked up to her and he stuck his thumb in her eye. And, and everybody was like, why would he do that? And he, when he had the words to say, he said, I wanted to know if she was real. Because mm -hmm. she didn't look real. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it was inappropriate. Yeah. And we all freaked out. But that's what he was trying to figure out. So first we need to get him to understand that the bunny is real. Yeah, the, la the language part of it is so yeah. important. There's no way to, you know, that's, I, I call it like some kind of encoding. They have to learn the language. Like, this is what real means and this is what pretend means. Yeah. And you start having to categorize what things are real and what things are pretend. And being very clear, you know, when you have three and four-year-old daughters at home, you might be wanting to have all these fantasy and kind of like, yeah, with the Christmas, with the past holidays, all yes. the things. But to him, you're going to have to speak very matter-of-factly. Okay. And to him, the more matter-of-fact you are, the easier you're making life. Yeah. If, you, you know, there's a lot of, I think there's mourning for parents because they want to do that with their, the traditions with their children too. Yeah. And, but really with kids on the spectrum, you, speaking more factually actually makes their world more clear. Yeah. They're already dealing with trying to figure out, you know, rules that keep changing or things that keep changing. So the more f clear you are about facts, it really does make it easier for the, and, all the kids. And just so you guys know, like, that's like an all-the-time thing then. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, you're at the store, you're at Sprouts, and you see, you know, somebody holding a, a, a real dog and somebody else holding a, a, you know, you go, is that a real dog or a fake one? Like, everything becomes yeah. the example constantly. Is that real or is that fake? Is that alive or is that pretend? Yeah. You know, you're reading a book and you go, is this little boy real or is this pretend? Constantly. As you're driving. Being, you're really? looking at billboards. Yes. You're pointing is that at real? Is that real? Yeah. Is that not? Yeah. And you, they, he has to, you're trying to define the world for him. Yeah. And the easiest way is just to tell him. Yeah. You can do lessons at home to give, to lay a foundation. Yeah. For, um, but it has to go through his whole life to try to figure out what's real and what's not. Then you have to give him the language to ask. Like, what is that? How does that work? <laughs> you know, and just give them the language to ask the questions that they're so inquisitive about, which is great that he's yes. inquisitive. And I've had so many kids finally be able to ask questions that they never used to, or like the way Jem's asking, like, yeah. I wanted to know if she was real. Yeah. And just how to formulate that kind of question is very difficult. Yeah, very difficult. But then at a certain point, I think somewhere in there, there's got to be either cause and effect or consequences or whatever to understand that, you know, what happens when you hurt somebody uh, and what the consequences, no? Yeah, there is, except I'd even go more concrete before even okay. that. Okay. Because cause and effect is very difficult. Yeah. Understanding that concept, because it's constantly changing, and you're relating two items in terms of time, too, yeah. and how they're related. And a lot of our kids, before they get to that abstract understanding of time, yeah, don't get it. Yeah. So a lot of times you will just be teaching them, when this happens, this is what happens. Yeah. You just teach them the sequence of activities. Or, and there's rule, our kids are rule governed. To keep them safe, you never take a knife to anything live. Yes. Like you just give really straightforward rules to keep them safe. And so make that rule. Make no that No knives rule. touch no. anything that's alive. Yeah, no knives, no scissors, nothing touches anything alive because life is precious. There you we just go. Teach them that. And they're rule governed. So if you can teach those kind of rules right at the top too, then for sure at least you're providing the barrier already. There we go. From anything dangerous or safety issues. And so again, <coughs> you would run, you would talk about that constantly. So mm -hmm. if you're taking out a knife to slice a piece of bread, you're saying, is this something that's alive? Can we cut it with a knife? Yes, it's not alive, mm -hmm. right? And now we're gonna, you know, cut a piece of roast beef. Is it alive? No, we can, you know. Yeah, it's a sandwich. It's like. Right, right. So we, can we use a knife on it? Yes. Yes. But, you know, uh, the, you keep, like, doing that example. Oh, drill down. You drill down all the safety. I say put in all the rules, provide yeah. that safety wall. Yeah. 
so that you don't have to worry about that anymore. And let's say I'm going to go there. Yes. Is, let's say you've taught all of that, but this child has some kind of fascination. You really do need to go contact a clinical psychologist. Okay. You know, and preferably one that understands um, the children or individuals on the spectrum. Yeah. So that they can navigate that divide and try to figure out is there something else going on? Because sometimes there is. I would also say it's time to, you know, he's 11 and you probably, and you, but you have a three and a four year old, you may have taken your all your safety stuff out, but put it back. Uh -huh. Like, you know, um, knife drawers can can be... Uh, locked up. Yep, totally yep. locked up. And, you know, scissors can be put in places where people can't get to them um, until you make sure that you have it under control. Now, the last part of this, she brought up the video game thing. <laughs> uh, and this is some dicey, dicey area. And I don't know the video game that you're saying, yeah, the Terraria. Um, and it, it very easily, if it's at all, you know, a lot of these games have little side things that they teach, and I've seen what the ramifications of those are. you got to really monitor. I would say to you that there is a wonderful uh, thing called Autcraft, which mm -hmm. is Minecraft, but it is monitored by an autism dad. And you sign your child up for it. You have to go through a process. He, you know, vets to make sure that it's really a child. They come in, and their time there is monitored, and he reports back to you if anything happens that's untoward. Very nice. And so I just want to encourage you to pull whatever the video game is right now until we know what's mm -hmm. happening. Like, I, I have nothing against this game. I don't know what it is. But, you know, for right now, you know, and put him in Autcraft and go, hey, I got this new thing, new place, um, and enjoy that for a while. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Uh, so, I mean, the whole video game world goes under that pretend, you know. I just spent um, through the holidays uh, doing a trip, my house building trip, uh -huh. um, with a teenager on the spectrum. Uh huh. And it was interesting just his world view, and he understands movies. Uh -huh. But um, his mom has taught him how to put all of the um, security settings. Uh -huh. to censor himself because oh. she knows what scares him oh. and he, she's taught him what scares that's him good. and then he goes in and turns on all his settings that's, that's clever yeah so yeah. it was really interesting just to kind of watch him through and I think like but that gave him a sense of control where he yeah. can go into a fantasy world and not worry about entering a, into, into something that is, is scary for him yeah and I think it's a great thing for your kids if you are going to sit and do a video game you should get to know it you need to go into that video game with him and start talking about, like in real life, we don't do this. Yeah. You know, so, so as he's playing the video game, stopping it, you know, which may annoy him, and saying, like, th in real life, you can't do this. Yeah. This is not allowed. Unfortunately, with a lot of the games, the game itself might be okay, but then it's all the people who come to the game and what they do in the game and to the game. Yeah. And some of these games, they have, you know, where... The, the people playing the game can change the rules of the game and create a, a skin yeah. in, in which this happens. Um, or you, your child could just be playing a regular, even in Minecraft, your child can be playing and doing whatever, and then somebody else can come in and burn everything that they've built down. This is why I really encourage you. We've had Stuart Duncan, he's the dad who does Autcraft. At this tender age of at 11, you like what better and it's free there's no cost to it he encourages people if they you know uh want to make a donation that they can but it's free to be That's able to great. do it and then you have some peace of mind knowing that your child is getting the social interaction because we don't want to totally take that out mm -hmm. but that it's productive and monitored so yeah. that if your child and and you'll see that there will be times that your child will do something in a video game that'll be inappropriate and they'll get kicked out and your child's like I don't know what happened and you can't go back and ask what happened what did he say it's just mm -hmm. a lost opportunity where is as in Autcraft if your child does something that they would normally get kicked out for they will send you a message and say hey this is what happened mm -hmm. they will have a conversation with him they will encourage you to have a conversation with him and then they get to stay that's great um, and learn. Yeah, because it's important. So many, uh, you have to, your child, our kids have a difficult time repeating and describing what happened. They may not have needed to not even notice cues, you know, and there is, even though many of our kids have good rote memory, their delayed memory is not very good, yeah. you know, or like their ability to repeat just what happened. And, and they can't communicate. I'm so sorry. <laughs> they can't communicate clearly enough 
for the parent to know. So you do, you know, to have this other monitor or to have somebody to sit with your child and just to explain, like, it's okay here in this video, but it's not okay in real life to discriminate. You have, yeah. you have to help them discriminate. Absolutely. Absolutely. I have no idea why my phone rang. It actually says here, do not disturb during this time. So I have no idea how that happened. I apologize. Uh, but it's a good time for us to take a break. Sounds good. And then we're going to come back with more of your questions after these messages. Stick with us. Do you provide care services to someone with autism? Recently, more and more children are being diagnosed with the condition and getting the support they need as awareness grows. But what happens to these children as they grow up? It's estimated that over half a million youth with autism will turn 18 in the next decade, and they'll be faced with a very difficult reality. As children with autism grow up, their services start to disappear or become very difficult to access. Things like medical care, mental health counseling, vocational training, and more. All services that are still desperately needed. The loss of support that youth with autism face as they grow up is so severe that it's referred to in the autism community as falling off a cliff. Adults with autism need the same level of support they had as children to avoid falling off the services cliff. Introducing Skills Living, the web-based software designed specifically to help transitioning youth and adults with autism so they can avoid the cliff and instead fly to success. With Skills Living, help your learner with autism develop the skills they need in all the critical areas of adult life including self-control, planning, and problem-solving, effective communication, performing life skill tasks for independent living, acquiring and maintaining employment or other meaningful activities, developing and maintaining social skills and relationships, accessing transportation and public services, and being safe. Skills Living includes a comprehensive assessment, a data collection mobile app, behavior intervention plan builder, and automatic progress reporting. It also provides a complete curriculum addressing 16 key areas spanning the entire range of functioning adulthood. Skills Living is easy to use and can be implemented by schools, parents, and autism service providers. Call or click today for your free demo and see how Skills Living can help your learner with autism avoid the cliff and instead reach their fullest potential. Skills Living wish, learn, become. Parent to parent, having a compliant child is one of the greatest things on earth. But frequently we ask ourselves, why doesn't my child listen? Well, here are some tips to help us to get a listening, happy, compliant child. First, we want to make sure that we make compliance worthwhile. Whenever your child does something that's compliant, make sure that you praise them and heap rewards on them that are meaningful to them, things they really want. One of the things that we have to be mindful of is that if the child isn't compliant, we have to praise more often. Just heap it on. If, you're, if you say to yourself, there's nothing to praise, they're not doing anything that I want them to do, then ask them to do something that they already want to do. This is a really tricky way of <laughs> being able to praise them. And then, of course, the last thing that we want to do is catch them doing good things when they least suspect it. And make sure you heap that praise on because having a compliant child is one of the best things in life. Hope and economies are a great way to get to good behavior with your child. You say howdy, we say hi. Let's get loud, let's get wild. Let's get, let's get, 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 let's get wild. Hi there, I'm Lisa Ackerman. Welcome to the show. So the goal of today, we're going to make meatballs. Let's get started. So again, I'm going to take a, roughly a pound of my ground organic turkey and I'm going to add in the secret vegetable. So if your kid doesn't like vegetables, don't cook in front of them, okay? Have them watch a movie or something. But you definitely want to make sure they're not watching because then they won't eat it. So, and here we go with the egg and our breadcrumbs. I'm just adding salt and pepper to taste. If you think about kids' shapes and sizes, you want to think small, small shapes, small hands. So your oven should be preheating 
at about 400 degrees. We're gonna kick into the oven here and look at our meatballs. I did flip them halfway through the 20 odd minute. So we'll put just like Julia Child's. There's our finished product right there. These are good. Cooking is easy. You don't have to be afraid of it. But we want to hear from you. If you can let us know what recipes are important to you, maybe convert a recipe from a traditional flour or gluten based to a, a gluten free or an allergy free, we're here to help. So you get to us, you can email us at autismlive at gmail.com. You can reach out on Facebook at facebook.com slash autismlive or reach out at Taka Now. So I know you're having a great day. I had a lot of fun cooking with you in the kitchen, but I'll tell you before we end, I gotta have more meatballs. Have a great day. Back to Autism Live. Couple of uh, notes here. Uh, we had somebody who wrote in on Facebook from New Zealand and said that they're joining us for the first time and welcome. And we just want to say how much our heart goes out to everybody in Australia and the fires and oh my gosh, yep. uh, we have so many friends and, and part of our autism family that are, that are there and I can't even imagine. I mean, first yeah. of all, I can't imagine. It's, it's just unthinkable what's happening. But then on top of that, when you have kiddos that are on the spectrum and you know, you don't know whether your neighborhood's going to be there. So, so tragic. Uh, we were just saying, uh, we've got one viewer who watches a lot, and, and she had posted on Facebook uh, last week, and she said, where is everybody? You know, we're on fire. And we're, and I wrote back, and I said, my goodness, I, you know, on CNN, they're telling us that the Americans are there. Uh, have you not seen evidence, but, but but they're telling us that they're there? Are they lying? What's the deal? And the very next day, she posted and said, Shannon, they're here. <laughs> and it was a picture of our California firemen uh, some of our brightest and best that have gone to Australia to help um, in this good fight to preserve, uh, you know, uh, it, it's just devastating uh, if you're an animal lover and seeing, because, you know, I, I think in the beginning people were like, well, it's, you know, some bush. It's certainly not anymore. No, and in the bush, terrible. it's the home for a lot of wildlife. Just so tragic, unspeakable. But welcome New Zealand and <coughs> our well thoughts, well wishes, and, and our best firefighters um, hope to Australia. Uh, okay, so uh, we had uh, another question here that I want to read um, that um, came to us from India that said, thank you for everything that you do. Thank you. My question today is, how do you guide parents about pursuing music or art to see if a child is gifted? Is it according to the interest of the child? My child has hyperlexia. She's good with numbers at a basic level, but has no savant abilities in math. Can she be gifted in music? <laughs> Great question. You can try. You know, yeah. we don't know. So, uh, you know, the world of our children completely is different from the typical world. Uh, being hyperlexic and under numbers, basically that means your child really likes things the same. I always say when a child comes in and can read, they read because the spelling of the word never changes, mm. you know? And when you can get a child to really focus their perseverations on something like that, it's really useful because the first couple of years of school, especially schooling, is very much memorized. Yeah. And if they can use any of their rote memory strength for that, it's, it only helps them. And those kids that come in that are hyperlexic and good with numbers, um, they're good because those the math facts never change. Yeah. Two plus two is always four, you know, 10 plus 10 is always 20. And if they can put their, um, their interest into something like that, it goes a long way because that's kind of how our world works. In terms of music, I've actually had lots of hyperlexic kids who are good with music. Yeah. Yeah. Makes and sense. It really does. And especially when you start attaching the letters to the keys on the piano. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know? Yeah. They start to, it and music never changes. Yeah. If there's a song you like, you play it the same way. Pretty much, you know, the same. Yeah. That, that's what that song is. Yeah. And if you change it, it becomes a different song. Right. And so we have had many kids come in who are hyperlexic and good with numbers, um, develop something like either, you know, a lot of them have. Um, perfect pitch. Mm. It's really interesting. Yeah. I don't know, how there, I don't, there's no test right now, but what you can do is you can teach um, 
you can have a teacher, a piano teacher, who needs to be flexible because the kids that learn piano don't actually learn it in the typical way because their brain, a lot of times, I think, has such that good memory, mm -hmm. the good rote memory, and they're very visual. A lot of times, they're going to be learning by what they see yeah. and how to um, use whatever musical instrument that you're going to use because one thing great about music is, yeah, you have the letters A through G and then you have the sharps and flats and you know, a chord is always a certain way, played a certain yeah. way, and it's very, very uh, routine and how you put it together. And because our kids, I think, like to play things exact and perfect, it make, I think that actually helps also. Mm -hmm. But you could have someone come in and start teaching your child a song that they know and teach it in not just like, first we're gonna learn this note and then that note. That is a little bit harder for our kids because it's harder for them to piece together information. Mm -hmm. But if your child's hyperlexic, that means they have some kind of like what they call chunking memory, where they see something and they see it as a group mm -hmm. versus seeing every letter and then putting the letters, oh. you know, it's a different right. part of your brain. Got it. And so when you're having someone come in and teach your child, let's say about music, th it's good to connect it to something that the child already knows. Okay. So if there's a song that your child knows, teach them something that they already know okay. and they'll start to put it together and then you can teach them, you know, notes on a piano or notes, how to read notes because that never changes either. Right. And, you know, test it out and see. We, there's no test, I mean, that I know of that there, you know, test to see if your child has perfect pitch or is going to be a savant or not. But, you know, expose them to it and just remember that anything new to your child is always bad. Yeah. So you have to give them that exposure enough so that it's not gets past the new yeah. and gets past the rigidity of new, yeah. not wanting new. And then once you can get past that, you give it a really good effort, you'll see some of the kids really attach to it very quickly. Yeah. We um, had an event that they, they do in Pasadena. I think they still do it. But when my son was little, um, they the city puts on a, um, it's, I think it's one Saturday a month, and they have some sort of performing artists come in every Saturday, once a month, and, and do this thing. But before that, they have an orchestral petting zoo. Oh, nice. And I did not know what that was, but we were going because they were having a storyteller, and I wanted to take my son, and we were taking a therapist. Mm -hmm. I just want to point out, this was something <laughs> we did with a therapist. Um, and I was like, what a great, because I, I, you know, Every family has different priorities, but I wanted my son to appreciate the arts, and I wanted him to be a good audience member. That's important in our family. I'm not saying that should be important in everybody's family, but in our family, we go to the theater a lot. Mm -hmm. I wanted him to have an appreciation. He has godparents that are assigned just to taking care of his theater life, <laughs> right? It's important in our family. Culturally, that's important to us. So, um, and I was like, I said to my husband, I said, what is an orchestral petting zoo? And I thought we were going to have animals there. But what they did was they had every instrument yeah. in the orchestra there. And they had little wipes so that it was all sanitary. But any child who wanted to could wait in a short line to get an opportunity to yeah, play right. that instrument. So, and I was chartreuse with envy because I've always wanted to play a bassoon, but how, what opportunity do you have to play a bassoon? <laughs> like, when does that come up except in fourth grade where they go, do you want to sign up to take lessons for bassoon? And if you're like, I don't know, I've never played it before. I might like it, I might not like it, right? It was like, we went every opportunity that they, they had, he loved yeah. it. And every time he would try different instruments, but it did lead to when he was in junior high that he was like, trumpet, that's the thing that I want to do. So I think find, if you can, find something like that. Mm -hmm. And if there isn't something like that, push your local orchestra to have something like that because everyone should have the opportunity to do that. Definitely. And uh, our, you know, it's and then it's the same thing with art. It's giving it's the exposure. Yeah. Don't give up at the beginning. A lot of our kids reject things just because it's new. Yeah. It has nothing to do with activity. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> just because it's new, they're rejecting. So anything that you try with your child, whether it be art or music instruments, anything, even toys, yeah. you have to give a good try where you're getting past the new aspect first. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And once you get past the new and they're familiar with it, you can they'll tell you whether they like it or not. Right. So if you're going to sign up for lessons, commit to doing it for a little while and not like at one lesson, oh, they didn't like it, give yeah. up. Okay. And then the other thing I'm just going to say, because new year, new resolutions and all of that, 
uh, is that do take, whether being a, uh, a good audience member is a part of your, what cultural, you know, thing that your family or not, but there are so many things that happen in a community and the places that we found that were the best to look for things to go and do, um, your local library, check what their schedule mm -hmm. is because they have programming and clubs and events that are for specific age ranges and, and it's all free. Mm -hmm. um, so that's a really great way to find, you know, we used to go every Wednesday they would have a, mus uh, they would have a musician or a magician or a craft at the local library and take your therapist with you mm -hmm. um, to do that. But also, if you are anywhere near a college campus that has a theater arts building in it, then they will occasionally have programming that will come in, and some of it is for kids. So check that out too. And that usually has a cost, but it's usually far less expensive than if you were gonna go see something at you know the commercial theater. Definitely. So check those things out. Okay. Um, okay, moving on to the next one. Hi there, I have two questions. My son earns screen time. You know what, let's, before we get to this one, we're gonna come back to this one, but um, let's take a short break. Stick with us. I did that so suddenly that Draven did not know. So we're gonna give him <laughs> one second. I wanna go to a break before we come back to this question, and I also wanna check in to see if you guys have written in anything on Facebook. We are gonna take a break, and then we're gonna be back right after this message. If you're watching Autism Live, chances are you care about the life of someone or perhaps many people living with autism. You spend countless hours trying to make a better life for them. It may not have been easy for you to watch the show today. You know, sometimes you could be juggling so many balls in the air, you feel like a circus performer. I remember recently saying to a friend that as the mother of a son with autism, plus all the other challenges in my life, I feel like I'm carrying a tray full of glasses of water, and that if one of them topples over, the whole thing is going to go crashing down. This empowerment moment is all about you. Now, I'm not a doctor or a therapist, but over the last nine years in my autism journey, I've learned some things that have helped me shift from being a victim to having hope. See, I've been in that place, down on the kitchen floor, on my knees, praying for answers of what happened to my child. I've been in that place covered with blood and tears after one of Wyatt's giant tantrums where I said, where has my fairy tale life gone? I have a feeling you're a member of that kitchen floor club too. It's been a process, but I've come from that place of being a victim to becoming an advocate for my son Wyatt and for many others as the executive director of ACT Today, or Autism Care and Treatment Today. Let's start with reframing the way you think about yourself and your child. I want you to say after me, I'm an activist. That's right, I'm an activist. Because just by watching this program, you are taking positive steps to make the world a better place for your child or someone else living with autism. You are a positive force of action in the world. I want you to start thinking of your so-called disability as an opportunity because it's within our challenges that our greatness is revealed. That's where we find our courage and resiliency. And parenting a child with autism is one of the greatest challenges a parent can face. You have the choice to see this as a journey of self-discovery. Some people take expeditions to climb Mount Everest to see what they're made of. You don't have to travel that far because parenting a child with autism is an expedition of the soul. Until next time, stay strong and keep the faith. Welcome back to Autism Live. Uh, I, we ended abruptly because I wanted to take a break before this question, and then we've got a question on Facebook and a question on YouTube. We're going to try to get it all in before the end of the hour. So here we go. Okay. Uh, hi there. I have two questions. Uh, so that's actually four questions. <laughs> my, my son earns screen time based on his day at school. Ever since he's been in the sixth grade, they do not tell me how or what he is doing. So therefore, what we have set up at home no longer works. 
Can a daily note home be put in his IEP? Second thing is my uh, is my son is able to tell me about his day. He has mentioned several bad days and allergy infractions which were unreported by the staff at school. He knows he can't have gluten or dairy and just yesterday told me he ate his friend's burger that wasn't gluten free and it was nasty and the teacher did not make him spit oh, it out. Man. Named the teacher by name. <laughs> Can I take my 11-year-old son out of sixth grade and homeschool him for this and put up his hours at card for educational goals? Are they violating FAPE? Thank you. I'm so disappointed in my son's school. And a lot of this is Bonnie-related, uh, and we'll run this by Bonnie okay. as well, uh, which will be on next Mondays as well. But, you know, um, so we're not going to really answer about what you can and cannot put, put in the IEP. You can decide to homeschool your child no matter what, but let's talk a little bit about... Um, what can she do to help her son to make better choices so that he himself doesn't want to eat somebody else's food? Well, there's actually even more on okay. that one. I was going to say is um, so many places to run. He has to figure out if the allergy makes him feel bad or not. Okay. He has to be able to identify either his physical state or how it feels, whatever it is, because he has to be able to identify the negative part. Yeah. If he just had this incident, he probably has, you know, I don't know what the side effects are, but a lot of the kids will be like, I can't control my body, or um, I don't feel good, or I'm like hot all the time, you know. Or my what stomach hurts. My stomach hurts. You know, yeah, Jem all the time. Jem yeah. knows, you know, yeah. he wanted something, cheese. Cheese, we did a had cheese. Had it. Uh, uh, where we tested to see if he could eat cheese, and he was so excited he ate the cheese, and he was like, "Mom, we gotta stop the cheese. My stomach." Hurts. <laughs> yeah. Right. And so, but he learns the cause and effect. Yep. He and sure so did. you have to make sure your child understands. Hey, when you have this, look at all the things that are hard yep. for him. This is how you feel. So if he can make that connection, then he will start to identify. Yeah. All of that. Sometimes it's just impulse control, though. And if it's impulse control, give him strategies for how to get around it. Okay. And it can be as simple as I had a kid who would just put, you know, this, uh, the little menus that they have on dinner tables. He would just put it between him and whatever the item was. Yeah. <laughs> and, but at least it was a small barrier, but it reminded him, you know, don't grab that french fry. Yeah. You know, sometimes it's as easy as that. Other times it's just asking, learning how to ask someone, hey, you know what? I really want that, but I can't have it. It's going to make me sick. Yeah. But can you, like, I'm going to need to move myself. Yeah. You know, yeah. away from where it is. Yeah. And making sure that he has other choices, because I know I know when things are not good for me. I have all these food allergies, but when I'm hungry, my ability to discern how I'm going to feel afterwards is like out the window. But you, you're really good when we go out to eat. You actually ask questions. Can of course, we go? Yeah. You know, you compensate, and he's going to have to learn how to do that too, to be able to say, "Hey, can we're, we have some kind of choice in this before we go?" Okay, yeah. so. Tomorrow there's a party at school. Can you pack me this instead? Yes. You know, yeah. whatever it may be. And he has to start learning how to do some of that self-management. Absolutely. Absolutely. But, but also, you know, we sent uh, like Lara bars to school and gave like a, a, a case of Lara bars to the teacher and said, if a treat comes in or something, you know, or if he says he's hungry, like, you know, so that there's something always that they can make the good Definitely. choice with instead of a nothing. Like. Definitely. Okay. But I will uh, have uh, Bonnie Yates address the re whether it's a violation of faith and so on. And I'm not going to answer that part, but a lot of times the easier you make it for the parent, the teacher, the more likely they'll communicate. So whenever the situation happens for me with the kids, a lot of times I will say, what do I want to know? And I'll actually like make a little chart with just those five items yeah. for the teacher. Yeah. And say, here's, a t here's, a, here's 50 copies. Yeah. Just check all the places, you know, how he did, and send it back to me. If you want them to write, it's harder. A lot of times just checking boxes is easier, and that way at least you'll find out some level of what's going on. And, and I will just tease that there's a whole level of things that if it's a medical necessity, that that goes into a different place in the IEP yes. if there's an actual allergic reaction. And it's one of the ways that we get one-on-one -on -one aids is if it's too much for the teacher to mm -hmm. process that we go, oh, I guess we're going to need a one-on-one -on -one aid then because That's what it's a keep medical them safe. necessity. Yeah. It keeps and, them safe. Um, yeah. So, um, and then all of a sudden they get very compliant and they're like, no, we will make sure that he does not eat it. And right? we will let you know. <laughs> right. We will let you, we, we'll start a communication log. Would you like a communication log? Yeah. It's funny how interesting it gets. 
Okay, so the question that came in on Facebook, my son likes to touch people's heads, their side, and started touching females inappropriately. Any suggestions? We don't have an age for this person, um, but this is tough. It's right? really tough, and it's the best, I don't know, it's the easiest form of negative attention. Your kid's smart. You know, he knows that if I do this, people react automatically. Yeah. And it's very difficult to get past. So you can teach him, you know, at home, separate with your ABA, in ABA, is teaching, don't do this. And then you have to practice not doing it. Yeah. You know, but a lot of times, because a lot of times the kids do it because it guarantees attention. You know, it might be negative, but it might not. But you also have to teach them other ways, more positive ways of getting attention. You know, being able to ask a question, being able to do some skill that everybody will turn around and be like, that's amazing what you just did, you know, so that they can get that kind of attention in another way. If they don't have any of those skills to get attention, they're going to keep relying on these negative ones. Yeah. For touching. And, and I just want to say, I mean, sh certainly with, for younger kids, the <coughs> those kinds of things, but let's be honest too, that some of this, you know, might be automatically reinforcing. I mean... Uh, you know, uh, some I know people who love to touch hair. We know kids who love to touch ears because they mm -hmm. like to touch ears. And look, it's not just kids on the spectrum. We have a whole host of men that we're trying to teach how to, you know, it not inappropriately touch women. Yeah. Right. So you know, saying what the rules are, making it clear, um, practicing it, rewarding good behavior, all good things. Notice yeah. that I didn't bring up punishing, right? Um, but um, I think it's very important that you help this young man to understand what's appropriate and what isn't and that very rule-oriented kind of thing. Yeah, definitely put up for anything that can turn into a safety hazard. You de our kids are rule-governed. Put up all the rules that you need to. You can do this, you can't do this, and when they can and when they can't because that at least will have one layer a barrier for and them. It's, when, when kids are little, people will put up with a whole lot, but then every year that you're, and every inch that your child grows, they tolerate less. Yes. It's so important to deal with this kind of stuff early. Yes. And while you're saying to him, and you don't touch women that this way, make sure that you're saying, and nobody gets to touch you that way either. Definitely. You know? Like, yeah. make it the whole big lesson. Okay. Uh, we're doing good on time. So uh, <laughs> the question that came in on YouTube, how can I help a child deal with stress of having an angry parent? Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and a lot of, look. This is a, common. A lot of parents on the autism spectrum are angry. Hello. Uh, and, and you know, I, like you can say something to me that brings me right back to a day when my child was going through intervention where we were discriminated against and I can be angry all over again like it was yesterday, wow. like it's today. Wow. Um, you know, so I, I do think it's commonplace. I think that it's one of the things that autism parents have in common is that there is a level of anger uh, that we need to be addressing. But how do we help the child? Oh, so many levels, because actually I'm, I am, just recently, I was helping a family. Yeah. And it, the anger w had nothing to do with autism. Mm -hmm. It was just some people have anger management problems. Yeah. And it's pretty common out there. Yeah. And don't project any of your own feelings onto the child first. Make sure that when the child, when let's say there is a parent, you know, a little bit out of control, and our kids are watching it, don't add to their stress. Yeah. Because I think many times it's easy for us, parents want to protect their kids, so they want to make sure a host of things are not happening. But when you're trying to make sure a host of whole th things are not happening, a lot of times that stresses our kid out more because maybe they didn't even know that was a possibility. They didn't know that was a consequence. Yeah. So really trying to figure out know what level your child is at I don't know the age but a lot of times is you know you watch them you make sure they're okay and when it's over the episode or if you have them in a safe place make sure everybody's emotions are down including your own before you sit down and talk to the child about what happened you know and you know just ownership actually is a really um, vague concept for a lot of our kids they don't know like how does it make me feel versus how it makes you feel. They feel like you know perspective taking is a main problem for cognition. Mm -hmm. So 
A lot of times is if you can, trying to figure out where the child is at mm -hmm. and then addressing whatever issues they have. Don't bring in more because I think that usually confuses a child more. Mm -hmm. If they're not able to, you know, you're worried about, you know, the future and this. And I know, like I sit and I, I had to talk to a parent because she was talking to the, him when he was, I don't know, 10, about when he's a father, he shouldn't be yelling. And the kid was just like, I have no clue what you're talking about. Right. And I know mom was just very protective and that was the correct conversation to have with the older child. Right. That was not typical, neurotypical, right. but for her, 10 year old that had nothing he just wanted to know that when's dad gonna stop slamming things yeah you know that's yeah. all he really wanted to know yeah. so learning like you know when this giving him a way to cope yeah you know that to, for safety yeah like if you need to leave the room go to your room you can close the door put on your headphones yeah create you know, a safe space create for a safe space for him for himself yeah. and and just showing him like this is where you can do when these yes. episodes happen yes and if and teaching it in multiple places yeah because if you're out what do you do you know you can go to the car yeah you know ask for the car and I'll you know we'll go with you create that safe space for him and then you can just check in later on um, and figure out like what do you need what can I do for you how can this work and I don't know if he's asking why questions a lot of our kids don't yeah they might be wondering why and when yeah um, but they're you know just you have to keep it at their level yeah their level of understanding don't increase it more because I think that that's what I've realized with all the families I've worked with where one parent or the other has had anger management and we've had to go in yeah. because um, either the child is having some kind of challenging behavior afterwards or or during or if there's like um, antecedents that manipulations that we could put into place so the, a lot of families, when there's certain combination of characteristics or events that happen in a home, yeah. there might be a guaranteed um, ex explosive anger or, right. you know, so teaching to understand that, hey, today might be a great day to go to grandma's house and <laughs> have a sleepover, yeah. you know, providing, yeah. you know, just you, you have to think and plan ahead a, a little bit more. Yeah. And I love that um, this parent is saying, you know, what can I do to help them to cope with it? But, you know, I think it would be remiss of us since we're bringing up parents being angry. You know, I, I, there is help mm -hmm. out there if the parent is willing and, and able. Obviously, you can't make somebody go to get help if, if they don't want it. But if there are parents who are watching and are having problems managing their own anger, you know, I, I fully encourage you to go and work with an LMFT and have a place where you can express that. If you really are like, I'm, I don't have the time or the money to go to a therapist, I would recommend uh, the best thing that I have ever found personally. I mean, there's two things that I would recommend. Um, but Byron Katie, we've had her on the show um, and she's worked extensively now with a lot of autism parents and she does a thing that's called the work. And it's a process that you write some whatever the thing is that are, is making you angry, and then you have to flip it and and discuss whether it's true or not true. It's a five step thing, and I'll tell you, it has helped me more than anything else with anger, um, because I think it's a very quick way of doing what the other thing is that I'm going to recommend, which is um, acceptance commitment therapy, which there are great books about that, and even a book that is written by an autism parent called The Reality Slap. Um, uh, Russ Harris, I think, is the author of that, I think. Um, but it's this whole concept of not saying to you, you have no right to be angry, because that doesn't work. Yeah, that right? doesn't work. That, doesn't work. <laughs> that does not That's work. That's just like push it down and it'll pop out someplace else. Um, but saying you have a right to your anger, what is it are you really angry about? But are there other things besides your anger so that we don't just become fixated on the thing that is making us angry or the thing that isn't right, right? And we look at everything um, and realize that there are a lot of good things happening while you are being angry. And if you have a child who's in an ABA intervention program, talk to the supervisor, talk to the BCBA and say, they can help you with a lot of the identifying antecedents, what to do for your child, but also they might have good referral sources for you, you know, or your spouse. And that's how I come into it. Yeah. Is because the parents, you know, are asking me like, hey, can we, during our parent training, and we talk about this issue yeah. that's happening in our household right now yeah. that maybe none of you have witnessed, right. but it is something that we have to deal with. 
And then so it's like I talked to the parents about let's, you know, really for me, I actually like setting up the safe space for the kids. Yeah. That's the part that I do a lot of. But then I encourage our families all the time for counseling and, yeah. you know, whether it's marriage counseling together or separately or both or going to, you know, local clergy or, you know, any yeah. whatever it may yeah. be, finding someone to help you because, you know, this is something, you know, that's going to help you and your family. Yeah. And I just want to be clear for anybody who's watching that a lot of times the anger that uh, sometimes it's anger about something that your child cannot do. Sometimes it's about that uh, or some a behavior that your child is engaging in. But I, I, my experience of the parents that I work with, nine times out of ten, our anger is the rest of the world and how they're treating our child. Yeah. That's where the anger. I've seen, I've seen a lot <laughs> of that, And the people yeah. who, like, should be doing their jobs and getting us the funding and the support and whatever who don't for whatever reason. That's where the anger comes in. Um, but anyway, we're so out of time. But I appreciate you so much for being here. Thank I you. appreciate all of you for being here. Uh, we are back tomorrow. Uh, what a great show we have tomorrow. Raven Woods, disability advocate, uh, is going to be here talking uh, about IEPs. Um, and then Carissa Winters, who's author of Your, Gu Your Guide to All Things Catacorn, is going to be with us. On Friday, we have Cassidy Smith. Uh, from HAPE. She's vice president of sales. This is one of the toy, uh, HAPE, excuse me. Uh, HAPE, uh, said it wrong. Uh, the, the great toys. The, they were featured in our toy guide. Can't wait to talk with them. These are some of the best, like, wood toys, but like wood toys on steroids. Yep. Fabulous, yep. right? Um, and then we have educational therapist Vanessa Leonard, who will be with us as well. Um, so all of that. And then, as I mentioned, we'll have Bonnie Yates next Monday. So we'll ask some of these IEP and FAPE questions of her. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Uh, we'll be back tomorrow. Until then, give your kiddos a hug from me and one for you, too. Bye-bye for now. <laughs>